Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Governor and Mrs. Brewer, Postmaster General and Mrs. Blunt, Congressman Dickinson and the other distinguished members of the Congress and the Alabama Legislature and the audience, officers, members of the Board of Directors, and members of the Alabama Chamber of Commerce, and my Alabama friends all. I want to first express my very sincere appreciation to the people of Alabama for the very warm welcome which they have given to me and to my wife on our arrival here today. And I particularly want to thank Governor Brewer for that very gracious and warm introduction. Governor Brewer and I never got to know each other as well as perhaps I would have liked because after he became governor of this state, I didn't stay a governor much longer. But I want you to know one thing, that I did have a chance to serve with him and to be with him at his Southern Governors Conference, and I was tremendously impressed with the sincerity and the depth and the dedication of Governor Brewer, and I think the state of Alabama is very fortunate to have him. As for the Postmaster General and his lovely wife, what can I say? He's taken us in Washington by storm with his very perceptive feeling for people and his very warm concern about the problems of the country and above all his courage. Who else would dare take on the monumental problems of reforming the postal division of the United States single-handed other than Red Blunt? And to Red and Mary Kay also a very, very warm thank you for opening your home to us uh, and making us feel so welcome. I'm sorry we can't try that tennis court, but there just isn't time and the weather doesn't seem too conducive to that right now anyhow. I am really pleased that included in the warmth of the welcome of the people of Alabama today was something that struck me as particularly significant, and that was the fact that the young people at the airport were so enthusiastic. And it showed me beyond any doubt that young people, just as old people, refuse to be conformed and patterned into a specific mold, and they have a right and a privilege and an obligation to think for themselves, and I'm glad to see how the young people of Alabama are thinking. One week ago tonight, I flew out to Des Moines, Iowa, and exercised my right to dissent. <laughs> this is a great country. In this country, every man is allowed freedom of speech, even the vice president. <laughs> Of course, there's been some criticism of what I said out there in Des Moines. Let me give you a sampling. One congressman charged me with, and I quote, a creeping socialistic scheme against the free enterprise broadcast industry. <laughs> now, this is the first time in my memory that anyone ever accused Ted Agnew of having socialist ideas. <laughs> On Monday, largely because of that address, Mr. Humphrey charged the Nixon administration with a calculated attack on the right of dissent and on the media today. Yet it's widely known that Mr. Humphrey himself believes deeply that the unfair coverage of the Democratic Convention in Chicago by the same media contributed to his defeat in November. <laughs> Now, 
Now his wounds are apparently healed, and he's, <laughs> he's casting his lot with those who were questioning his own political courage a year ago. But let's leave Mr. Humphrey to his own conscience. America already has too many politicians who'd rather switch than fight. <laughs> there were others that charged that my purpose in that Des Moines speech was to stifle dissent in this country. Nonsense. The expression of my views has produced enough rugged dissent in the last week to wear out a whole covey of commentators and columnists. <laughs> One critic charged that the speech was disgraceful, ignorant, and base, that it leads us as a nation, he said, into an ugly era of the most fearsome suppression and intimidation. One national commentator, whose name is known to everyone in this room, said, I hesitate to get in the gutter with this guy. Another commentator charges that it was one of the most sinister speeches that I've ever heard made by a public official. The president of one network said that it was an unprecedented attempt to intimidate a news medium, which depends for its existence upon government licenses. The president of another charged me with an appeal to prejudice and said that it was evident that I would prefer the kind of television that would be subservient to whatever political group happened to be in authority at the time. And they say I have a thin skin. <laughs> Here indeed are classic examples of overreaction. These attacks do not address themselves to the questions I raised. In fairness, others, the majority of the critics and commentators, did take up the main thrust of my address. And if the debate that they have engaged in continues, our goal will surely be reached. Our goal, which of course is a thorough self-examination by the networks of their own policies and perhaps prejudices. That was my objective then. And that's my objective now. Now let me repeat to you the thrust of my remarks the other night and perhaps make some new points and raise a few new issues. I'm opposed to censorship of television of the press in any form. I don't care whether censorship is imposed by government or whether it results from management and the choice and presentation of the news by a little fraternity having similar social and political views. I'm against, I repeat, I'm against media censorship in all forms. But a broader spectrum of national opinion should be represented among the commentators in the network news. Men who can articulate other points of view should be brought forward. And a high wall of separation should be raised between what is news and what is commentary. And the American people should be made aware of the trend toward the monopolization of the great public information vehicles and the concentration of more and more power in fewer and fewer hands. Should a conglomerate be formed that tied together a shoe company and a shirt company, some voice will rise up righteously to say that this is a great danger to the economy and that the conglomerate ought to be broken up. But a single company in the nation's capital holds control of the largest newspaper in Washington, D.C., and one of the four major television stations, and an all-news radio station, and one of the three major national news magazines all grinding out the same editorial line. And this is not a subject that you have seen debated on the editorial pages of the Washington Post or the New York Times. For the purpose of clarity, before my thoughts are obliterated in the smoking typewriters of my friends in Washington and New York, 
let me emphasize that I'm not recommending the dismemberment of the Washington Post Company. I'm merely pointing out that the public should be aware that these four powerful voices hearken to the same master. I'm raising these questions so that the American people will become aware of and think of the implications of the growing monopoly that involves the voices of public opinion on which we all depend for our knowledge and for the basis of our views. When the Washington Times Herald died in the nation's capital, that was a political tragedy. And when the New York Journal American, the New York World Telegram and Sun, the New York Mirror, and the New York Herald Tribune all collapsed within this decade, that was a great, great political tragedy for the people of New York. The New York Times was a better newspaper when they were all alive than it is now that they are gone. And what has happened in the city of New York has happened in other great cities of America. Many, many strong, independent voices have been stilled in this country in recent years. And lacking the vigor of competition, some of those who have survived have, let's face it, grown fat and irresponsible. I offer an example. When 300 congressmen and 59 senators signed a letter endorsing the president's policy in Vietnam, it was news. It was big news. Even the Washington Post and the Baltimore Sun, scarcely house organs for the Nixon administration, <laughs> placed it prominently in their front pages. Yet the next morning, the New York Times, which considers itself America's paper of record, did not carry a word. Why? Why? If a theology student in Iowa should get up at a PTA luncheon in Sioux City and attack the president's Vietnam policy, my guess is that you'd probably find it reported somewhere in the next morning issue of the New York Times. But when 300 congressmen endorsed the president's Vietnam policy, the next morning it's apparently not considered news fit to print. Just this Tuesday, when the Pope, the spiritual leader of half a billion Roman Catholics, applauded the president's effort to end the war in Vietnam and endorsed the way he was proceeding, that news was on page 11 of the New York Times. The same day, a report about some burglars who broke into a souvenir shop at St. Peter's and stole $9,000 worth of stamps and currency, that story made page three. How's that for news judgment? <laughs> a few weeks ago here in the South, I expressed my views about street and campus demonstrations. Here's how the New York Times responded. He, that's me, <laughs> lambasted the nation's youth in sweeping and ignorant generalizations when it's clear to all perceptive observers that American youth today is far more imbued with idealism, a sense of service, and a deep humanitarianism than any generation in recent history, including particularly Mr. Agnew's generation. That's what the New York Times said. Now, that, that seems a peculiar slur on a generation that brought America out of a Great Depression without resorting to the extremes of communism or fascism. That seems a strange thing to say about an entire generation that helped to provide greater material blessings and more personal freedom out of that depression for more people than any other nation in history? We have not finished the task by any means, but we are still on the job. Just as millions of young Americans in this generation have shown valor and courage and heroism fighting the longest and least popular war in our history, so it was the young men of my generation who went ashore at Normandy under Eisenhower 
and with MacArthur into the Philippines. Yes, my generation, like the current generation, made its own share of great mistakes and great blunders. Among other things, we put too much confidence in Stalin and not enough in Winston Churchill. But whatever freedom exists today in Western Europe and Japan exists because hundreds of thousands of young men of my generation are lying in graves in North Africa and France and Korea and a score of islands in the Western Pacific. This might not be considered enough of a sense of service or a deep humanitarianism for the perceptive critics who write editorials for the New York Times, but it's good enough for me, and I'm content to let history be the judge. Now let me talk briefly about the younger generation. I have not and I do not condemn this generation of young Americans. Like Edmund Burke, I wouldn't know how to draw up an indictment against a whole people. After all, they're our sons and daughters. They contain in their numbers many gifted, idealistic, and courageous young men and women. But they also list in their numbers an arrogant few who march under the flags and portraits of dictators, who intimidate and harass university professors, who use gutter obscenities to shout down speakers with whom they disagree, who openly profess their belief in the efficacy of violence in a democratic society. Oh yes, the preceding uh, generation had its own breed of losers, and our generation dealt with them through our courts, our laws, and our system. The challenge is now for the new generation to put its house in order. Today, Dr. Sidney Hook writes of stormtroopers on the campus. That fanaticism seems to be in the saddle. Arnold Beichmann writes of young Jacobins in our schools who have cut down university administrators, forced curriculum changes, halted classes, closed campuses, and set a nationwide chill of fear all through the university establishment. Walter Lacour writes in commentary that the cultural and political idiocies perpetuated with impunity in this permissive age have gone clearly beyond the borders of what is acceptable for any society, however liberally it may be constructed. George Kennan has devoted a brief, cogent, and alarming book to the inherent dangers of what's taking place in our society and in our universities. Irving Kristol writes that our radical students find it possible to be genu genuinely heartsick at the injustice and brutalities of American society. At the same time, they're blandly approving of injustice and brutality committed in the name of the revolution, or as they like to call it, the movement. Now those are not names drawn at random from the letterhead of an Agnew for Vice President Committee. Those are men more eloquent and erudite than I, and they raise questions that I've tried to raise. For we must remember that among this generation of Americans, there are hundreds who have burned their draft cards and scores who have deserted to Canada and Sweden to sit out the war. To some Americans, a small minority, these are the true young men of conscience in the coming generation. Voices are, and will continue to be raised in the Congress and beyond, asking that amnesty, a favorite word, amnesty should be provided for these young and misguided American boys. And they will be coming home one day from Sweden and from Canada and from a small minority of our citizens they will get a hero's welcome. They are not our heroes. Many of our heroes will not be coming home. 
Some are coming back in hospital ships, without limbs or eyes, with scars they shall carry for the rest of their lives. Having witnessed firsthand the quiet courage of wives and parents receiving posthumously for their heroes Congressional Medals of Honor, how am I to react when people say, stop speaking out, Mr. Agnew, stop raising your voice? Should I remain silent while what these heroes have done is vilified by some as a dirty, immoral war and criticized by others as no more than a war brought on by the chauvinistic anti-communism of Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon? No, these young men made heavy sacrifices so that a developing people on the rim of Asia might have a chance for freedom that they obviously will not have if the ruthless men who rule in Hanoi should ever rule over Saigon. What's dirty or immoral about that? One magazine this week said that I'll go down as the great polarizer in American politics. Yet when that large group of young Americans marched up Pennsylvania Avenue and Constitution Avenue last week, they sought to polarize the American people against the president's policy in Vietnam, and that was their right. And so it is my right and my duty to stand up and speak out for the values in which I believe. The audience has risen to its feet to applaud the Vice President. How can you ask the man in the street in this country to stand up for what he believes if his own elected leaders weasel and cringe? It's not an easy thing to wake up each morning to learn that some prominent man or some prominent institution has implied that you are a bigot or a racist, or a fool. I'm not asking immunity from criticism. This is a lot of the man in politics. We wouldn't have it any other way in a democratic society. But my political and journalistic adversaries sometimes seem to be asking something more, that I circumscribe my rhetorical freedom while they place no restriction on theirs. As President Kennedy observed in a far more serious situation, uh, this is like offering an apple for an orchard. We do not accept those terms for continuing the national dialogue. The day when the network commentators and even the gentlemen of the New York Times enjoyed a form of diplomatic immunity from comment and criticism of what they said is over. Yes, gentlemen, that day has passed. Just as a politician's word, wise and foolish, are dutifully recorded by press and television to be thrown up at him at the appropriate time, so their words should be likewise recorded and likewise recalled. When they go beyond fair comment and criticism, they will be called upon to defend their statements and their positions, just as we must defend ours. And when their criticism becomes excessive or unjust, we shall invite them down from their ivory towers to enjoy the rough and tumble of public debate. <laughs> I don't seek to intimidate the press or the networks or anyone else from speaking out, but the time for blind acceptance of their opinions is past, and the time for naive belief 
and their neutrality is gone. As to the future, each of us could do worse than to take as our own the motto of William Lloyd Garrison, who said, and I quote him, I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. You have just heard an address by Vice President Spiro Agnew. The Vice President spoke tonight before the Alabama Chamber of Commerce in the Jefferson Davis Hotel in Montgomery, Alabama. Since the Vice President's speech was released to the press several hours before it was delivered, there was already a sizable reaction from members of the Congress and those who came under fire. The President of the Washington Post Company, Mrs. Catherine Graham, issued the following statement. Quote, Vice President Agnew's remarks about the Washington Post Company are not supported by the facts. The Washington Post, Newsweek, WTOP Television, and Radio decidedly do not grind out the same editorial line. It is a long-standing policy of the Washington Post Company to enlist in each of its enterprises the best professional journalist we can find and to give them a maximum of freedom in which to work. Each branch is operated autonomously. They compete vigorously with one another. They disagree on many issues. We think that the result is journalism of a high caliber that is notable for a diversity of voices on a wide range of public issues. As to the voices of public opinion in the Washington area, they are plentiful and diverse. Washington is one of the most competitive communication cities in America by any objective standard. It is only one of three cities left with three major newspapers under separate ownership, all of them first rate. Mrs. Graham's statement goes on to conclude, in addition to the four major TV stations, there are three UHF stations, including one of the nation's leading educational stations. Radio is even more competitive in the area with some 35 outlets. In New York, Arthur Ox Sulzberger, president and publisher of the New York Times, issued a statement tonight. Here it is in part. Quote, Vice President Agnew is entitled to express his point of view, but he is in error when he implies that the New York Times ever sought or enjoyed immunity from comment or criticism. Indeed, all American institutions, from the press to the presidency, should be the subjects of free and open debate. It would be wise, however, for those involving themselves in such a discussion to be certain of their facts. Some of Mr. Agnew's statements are inaccurate. That was a statement by Arthur Alts, Salzberger, president and publisher of the New York Times. Reaction from Capitol Hill has been mixed. In some cases, it followed party lines, but not always. Here is a sampling of those statements available. In Washington, Senator Philip Hart of Michigan, a Democrat, a foe of media concentration, challenged Agnew to drop what he called his shrill, bad-tempered approach and instead establish a level-headed program to cure it and without concentration on just those establishments critical of the administration. House uh, Republican leader Gerald Ford of Michigan said he approved of Agnew speaking out on issues that bother him, but he said, I don't want to get into any controversy between the vice president and the media. Certainly, he said, the vice president has not destroyed anyone's property or threatened anyone's health or safety, as some others have, in expressing themselves. Agnew's speech drew immediate criticism from Representative Ogden Reed, Republican of New York State, former president and editor of the late New York Herald Tribune, who called the speech inaccurate, inappropriate, and irresponsible. Representative John R. Rarick, a Democrat of Louisiana, said Agnew was right on target. He predicted that the opposition will try to deny Agnew's freedom of speech and assassinate his character. Congressman Donald Frazier, a Democrat of Minnesota, president of the Democratic Study Group, which consists of liberal House Democrats, said, Quote, I think there is a real danger in the line which the vice president is taking on behalf of the administration. He said there is clearly an effort to intimidate the press, both printed and the broadcast media. Congressman Charles Mosher, a Republican of Ohio, a veteran small-town newspaper editor and publisher before coming to Congress, said, I think the Times and the Post are great newspapers, but I think any newspaper and television newscaster should expect, and I think is accustomed to, attacks. Mosher went on to say, I've always felt we should level some of the same sort of criticism at ourselves. I think we deserve some of this criticism. Representative Donald Lukens of Ohio, a Republican, said of the speech, it's beautiful. That was a sampling of congressional reaction to the vice president's speech tonight. At the White House, presidential news secretary Ron Ziegler said, President Nixon was not given an advanced copy of the vice president's speech. 
Asked directly if the president had read Agnew's speech, Ziegler said no. The vice president's speech came to you from Montgomery, Alabama. 